Hi everyone, and thank you for joining us today for our talk on sacrifice. And before we go further, we wish to acknowledge and pay respect to the traditional owners and custodians of the lands on which we are gathered, both physically and virtually. The University of Melbourne campuses are situated on the lands of the Wurundjeri and Wurrung peoples, the Jaja Wurrung people, the Yorta Yorta Nation, and the Wada Wurrung people. Sovereignty has never been ceded. We acknowledge and pay our respects to all elders past, present and emerging, and we extend that respect, respect to all Aboriginal, Torres Strait Islander, Maori and other First Nations peoples with us today. Ellen Avella, Daniel Williams and I are presenting about our sacrifice research, a collaboration guided by archaeology, robotics and theatre with the aim of engaging the public in an immersive performance art experience. Apologies. Okay. So, could you trust a robot enough to collaborate with it? What about a robot swarm? And what if the robots were presented as standing stones, an ancient and cross cultural phenomenon? These questions propel our interdisciplinary research project, investigating standing stones and swarm robotics, a new approach to ancient and emerging technologies. The creative outcome of our research is the performance installation Sacrifice, which we approach from the perspectives of performance art, archaeology, machine intelligence, mechatronics, theatrical fabrication, and philosophy. Sacrifice invites members of the public to join a swarm of autonomous robot vehicles, each transformed into a significant ancient standing stone from cultural sites around the world. Participants will become actors in a performance where the relationships between the past and present, ancient and modern, material and technological, historical and fictional, um, sacred and profane will be blurred. Each stone comprises a replica standing stone costume and an omni rover, a robot specifically designed and created for this project, with each stone acting autonomously within the assembled stone family. On the slide here, you can see the University of Melbourne Sacrifice research team. Our work is discovery and practice led, necessitating a process of unlearning as we test the bounds of our individual disciplines and explore the harmonies and tensions that exist within and between them. Thus, the process itself becomes a part of our exp experimental research methodology and perhaps part of the performance. Our work will result in an exhibition at the Science Gallery Melbourne, which opened earlier this year. Science Gallery describes itself as exploring the collision of art and science and playing a vital role in shifting our understanding of science, art and innovation. Science Gallery is for everyone, but with a particular focus of engaging 15 to 25 year olds. Our Science Gallery is but one of nine and the others are listed here. This may give you a better context for the work we are undertaking together and its intended audience. And Sacrifice is scheduled for September next year. As our work together has progressed, the recurring questions that we return to are, to what extent are we bound by our disciplines and what does truly interdisciplinary research involve and mean? What is trust and how do we measure this? What is technology and what is taboo? Sacrifice is being developed in collaboration with a global network of archaeologists and cultural custodians whom we have invited to share one standing stone from a site in their country and together we are assembling our own stone circle. Where possible, we are asking for our research partners to share photogrammetric models, but these are generally unavailable. In these cases, we ask that our research partners share photographs from which we can create these models um, and bearing in mind also that now not all sites are um, easily accessible, especially, especially in this current period. Uh, we are committed to reproducing one-to-one -one replicas and have experimented with 3D printing as an option. And here you can see um, some images of um, home printing and um, commercial grade printing. Although there are many advantages to this reproduction technique, we have determined that this does not result in the stoniness that we are after, and we have thus decided upon theatrical fabrication to create these stone shells. And these will contribute to a more nuanced materiality of the standing stones. 
Right, and now with great pleasure, I introduce to you our research partners. We have commenced working with archaeologists from five countries, and our research is possible only through their generosity and enthusiasm. They are Dr. Hussein Sisse um, from the Gambia, Dr. Francisco Corrales and colleagues from Costa Rica, Dr. Agnese Kukela um, from Latvia, but we are working on Polish stones together, um, Professor Yusuf Bokbot and Hamza Benatia from Morocco, and Professor Dr. Tsagan Turbat from Mongolia. And if any of our research partners are in the audience, thank you for working with us and joining today. We are at present following up on other leads overseas, but our next and most important focus is approaching communities across Australia to see whether they would like to work with us. And something of particular importance is not just that this data is kind of shared to us in this one way um, direction, but we are um, looking to collaborate on various outputs. So for example, an exhibition catalog, storyboards, publication, and we're um, looking perhaps to organize a colloquium as well. We have conducted preliminary meetings with our colleagues about these sites, and each conversation reveals much, not just about the archaeology, but the politics and history of each region, the archaeological traditions of these and neighboring countries, the academic viewpoints of contemporary archaeologists working with these materials, and sometimes the ways in which modern communities engage with these sites and these stones. For example, we have learnt that the Gambian stones bring comfort even today and are embraced and understood to emanate warmth. And in Costa Rica, the stones have been reclaimed as an act of decolonization. The work on these um, cultural objects prompts many questions, such as what does it mean to remove these stones from their contexts? Where is the line between celebration and appropriation? What narratives are formed in bringing these disparate stones together? And when is a stone not a stone? So now I hand over to Eleanor and Daniel, who will tell us more about the robotics component of our research. Thank you, Alex. Um, we're now going to shift our focus to a newer technology, robots. Below, as um, you can see in this video, is a group of robots. These are designed and fabricated in our lab, working as a collective to achieve a common goal. This is known as a swarm of robots. Daniel and my research area is in robotics and automation specifically focusing on swarm, of ro swarm robotics. Um, we take inspiration from natural phenomena, such as in these pictures, schools of fish or flocks of birds. And in the video example you see below, this is an example of herding. We often, um, these behaviours that we designed are called behaviour dynamics, and these enable the swarm to collaborate and achieve a specific goal. One key challenge in swarm robotics is how can humans and robots collaborate? A preliminary step in creating fruitful collaborations is understanding trust from the perspective of the human to the robotics form. So moving on to our next slide, why use swarms? What can they offer? Um, increasingly, we are seeing groups of robots used to automate repetitive tasks in industry, service, caregiving, hospitals, and in our case, interactive art is what we're focusing on. For future advancements, we imagine scenarios we will have humans and, work, um, and robots working alongside each other. We believe trust is, is pivotal to the advancement of robotic collaborations. And from a roboticist perspective, what we are looking to get out of this project and want to study is the necessary and sufficient conditions for successful interaction, people and robots in particular, with a focus on trust. We are using insights from psychology to inform the development and notions for a measurement of trust in this area. And we believe humans' relationships with stones can do the same. So thanks, Alex. We might jump one more slide. <laughs> um, beautiful. So this comes to our question, how does a human robotics form collectively and autonomously engage to complete a task in an artistic setting? The picture you see in the left is the exhibit that we will be holding where a human is immersed with a group of stones. And on the right, this is how we represent um, the humans of the stones from an algorithmic perspective. We plan to use human relationships with the monoliths as a starting point for exploration. 
The monoliths are innate, but they have had established stable relationship dynamics with humans within the host societies. As a stepping stone to trust driven, driven interactions with robotics, swarms, consider what if monoliths were imbued with movement? I will now pass on to Daniel to describe how we are conducting our trust experiment through this interactive work. Uh, thank you, Arnold. To reiterate, through this gallery installation, we'd like to study how people's trust evolves to accommodate the swarm of robotic agents. I'm sure that you've heard enough to form an idea of what this would mean, but you might have a few questions. First, what will the exhibition be like? As you can see here, the agents have a monolithic appearance formed by photogrammetry at our archeological sites but the movement will be driven by a ground-based robotic platform developed in-house at UMOB's flight lab. These robots' movements can be directed using classical control engineering algorithms. Secondly, how do we plan to study trust? We hope to capture the essence of visitors' interactions with the standing stones through a number of modalities. We can ask visitors explicitly about trust through surveys but we also can have cameras installed in the gallery to gather more implicit indicators of trust, such as body movement and gaze tracking. We hope that we will be able to use the collected interaction data to learn a model of trust in the swarms for humans. In this way, we might eventually be able to train robotic swarms to interpret new human behaviors and recognize the implementation for humans' trust level. Uh, next slide, Alex. So that's our direction for future research. We've already gotten started with a preliminary experiment looking at trust preferences in robot swarms. Motivated by literature examining trust in social psychology and human automation interaction, we wanted to see whether these results could be transferred to the domain of human swarm interaction. As you can see in these four images, we film the swarm executing different behaviours. We then showed different paired combinations of these to people in a survey. By simply asking which swarm the people would trust more, we could build up a set of trust preferences for the behaviours. To rewind a bit, before we can process the trust preferences, we need to assign each behaviour a numerical label. We've used a semi-supervised learning model called Valma to take each video and translate it into a small set of numbers with which we can uniquely identify the swarm behavior. We then use a support vector classifier to figure out where a human's trust preferences lie relative to each behavior. This means that for a given person, we can figure out how a swarm can behave to gain the person's trust. This is a very exciting result, and we hope that subsequent experiments will lead us to understand how to craft better interactions between humans and robotic swarms. I'll now pass back to Alex. Thanks, Daniel. And speaking of trust, this is a core component of the relationships that we are developing with our archaeological research partners. All digital stone models that we create will be returned to their places of origin. We are developing research data management plans and data governance frameworks in order to ensure appropriate and secure handling of these invaluable cultural materials in digital form. As mentioned, we are now looking to invite partners from within Australia, and it is crucially important to us that we are working in ways that support Indigenous data governance. I've included here the CARE principles, um, and there's a link to further information. And these provide a framework for retaining community control over Indigenous data. In creating a replica stone circle, an unnatural site, we, are, we as archaeologists are confronted with a number of significant provocations. On the one hand, these standing stones from around the world could be said to decenter Eurocentric discourses or that they symbolise the multicultural society of Australia. But what happens when a stone is extracted from its context? What does it mean to bring these together in Australia with its colonial past? What does this type of aggregation reveal about the collection of cultural heritage materials? And what stories are we telling in bringing these stones together? 
So is this even archaeology? I think that's my greatest provocation for you today. Um, so as we continue our work, we are interrogating our process. And these are themes that we are exploring through work with our archaeological research partners. Our interdisciplinary and practice-led methodology, despite occasional challenges, means that we have the opportunity to explore trust and taboo in ways that may not otherwise be possible in more strictly defined research projects or classical disciplines, if you will. As you can see, the exhibition title is intentionally provocative. We want our audience to question the ways in which sacrifice can be understood, what it means to them and what it might mean to others. Thank you so much for listening and we look forward to your feedback and questions.